Another day at the office. It's an oftentimes facetious statement used to describe a pro wrestler ending up in a less than ideal physical predicament at the end of a hellacious match. Battered and mangled as they are, injuries are an unfortunate given in such a physical form of entertainment, hence the common another day at the office quip. In fact, multiple wrestlers getting notably hurt at an event is not rare either. But what if there was a WWE pay-per-view, a major production that saw five different wrestlers suffer very distinct, very notable injuries through the course of the night? Because that's exactly what happened on one occasion. Between freak occurrences and some heightened risks, one particular pay-per-view was anything except another day at the metaphorical office. I'm Jack from Cultaholic, and this is the true story of Over the Limit 2010, the parade of injuries. WWE at this point in 2010 was very much in a state of business as usual, between WrestleMania grudges still playing out and the general navigation that one expects during the lull between big four pay-per-views. But there are a few odd moments in there that give the time frame its own unique flavor. For one, you had Bret Hart becoming WWE United States Champion after defeating The Miz one night in Toronto. Yes, 52-year-old, largely inactive Bret Hart won one last championship in WWE, less than two months after old nemesis Shawn Michaels retired. When you remember that both Michaels and Undertaker came into the year holding belts, it dawns on you that all three men were champions that year. The last time all three held gold in the same year was 1997, 13 years earlier. This was also the same period in which WWE's touring and an episode of Monday Night Raw were compromised by a volcanic eruption in Iceland. That's unusual, certainly. Then there was also the first season of NXT The Game Show, in which a winless Daniel Bryan was among the first wrestlers to be eliminated. Bryan would go on to reign five times as some form of WWE champion, while the rest of the eclectic cast combined to hold, um, zero world titles. With more than a decade of hindsight, NXT The Game Show only comes off more absurd. There was the time that respected moonwalker Buzz Aldrin hosted Raw, and with all due respect to Mr. Aldrin, that bit of TV was more surreal than any hallucination that Bray Wyatt's ever had. All of this borderline Kafka-esque reality led up to Over the Limit. Taking place on Sunday night, May 23rd in Detroit, Over the Limit was not unlike most pay-per-view offerings for the month of May. There were some WrestleMania blow-offs, some stories to bridge the lean months, and a few one-off bouts to fill out the undercard. By no means was it a blow-off card, but not exactly a weak lineup on paper either. Like many Judgment Days, for example, preceding it, this was very much a take-it-or-leave-it offering. In the main event, WWE Champion John Cena was set to square off with Batista for the fourth time in as many consecutive pay-per-views. After dropping his freshly won gold to Big Dave in an impromptu match at Elimination Chamber, Cena regained the title from Batista in a criminally underrated match at WrestleMania 26. Though he defeated Batista in a last man standing rematch at April's Extreme Rules, Batista earned another shot by winning a number one contenders match on the May 3rd episode of Raw. Cena earned the right to pick a stipulation and chose to make the title bout an I Quit match. Also from the WrestleMania rematch files, CM Punk was matched up with Rey Mysterio for the third straight pay-per-view. Mysterio won at WrestleMania 26 in a match where he'd have to pledge to the Straight Edge Society if he lost. In a rematch where Punk would have to have his head shaved if he lost, the Straight Edge Society leader eked out the victory. But at Over the Limit, the two wages were efficiently combined for one convenient match, Pledge versus Hair. Other matches announced for Over the Limit included World Heavyweight Champion Jack Swagger, still sounds a bit weird, facing The Big Show, while longtime frenemies Edge and Randy Orton were set for singles competition. Divas Champion Eve Torres was matched up against Maurice, while long reigning IC Champion Drew McIntyre was booked against Kofi Kingston, a bit of a battle of two men who'd each win the WWE title at WrestleMania in a decade's time. Tag Team Champions The Hart Dynasty defended their titles against the thrown-together duo of ex-Big Show partners Chris Jericho and The Miz. And finally, R-Truth went one-on-one -on -one with Million Dollar Champion Ted DiBiase, now seconded by his father's former bodyguard Virgil, although sadly neither the belt nor a duffel bag full of Olive Garden breadsticks were on the line. All in all, about what you'd expect out of a middle-of-the-road sort of pay-per-view. 
a high stakes main event, a high stakes mid card match, a few insta feuds, and some general filler that's all too common for a promotion with a dozen or so annual pay per views and the necessity to book from one month to the next. But as already indicated, this was no ordinary event. Let's begin with Truth vs. DiBiase. Ted Jr. at this point was basically playing the part of his father, although more in the spoon-fed trust fund sort of vein. The million dollar son was carrying his dad's old belt and was flanked by his dad's former bodyguard. All that was missing was the sleeveless button up gimmick for entrances and the nefarious laugh that really nobody could do as well as his old man. And that was the problem, it wasn't as good as the old man. DiBiase Jr., with all due respect to his underrated technical skill, kind of paled against his father's legendary portrayal of a cartoonishly heartless magnate, and the younger Ted had difficulty making this role work. His most notable outing with the character was this match with R-Truth, albeit for the wrong reasons. Very early on in the match, DiBiase angrily slapped Truth, prompting Truth to return serve with a slap of his own. The slap itself didn't seem especially brutal, but DiBiase would probably disagree with that assessment. In fact, his body language indicated as much. As soon as Truth strikes DiBiase, Ted Jr. teeters in unusual fashion and stumbles towards the turnbuckles. Clearly, his balance is greatly disrupted. Truth carries on with the action, and while DiBiase is soon going through the motions of the match with him, it's very clear that he's out to lunch. It was later revealed that DiBiase sustained a concussion off the open hand slap. The reigning million dollar champion was briefly knocked out from the strike, hence the bizarre manner in which he staggered towards the corner of the ring. In a later interview, DiBiase remembers waking up to Truth throwing punches on him in the corner and through his confused haze, asking why Truth was punching him. In fairness, if you suddenly woke up to find the eternal 24 seven champion punching you in the head, you'd probably be a bit perplexed as well. I say eternal 24 seven champion, at the time of recording, his thunder's been stolen slightly by Reginald. One match later was the Pledge vs. Hair match between Ray and Punk, on paper one of the more promising matches of the night. Given time, one has to assume that Mysterio and Punk could steal any show that they're booked together on. And depending on one's tastes, this may have been the best match at Over the Limit, and that's in spite of an in-match disruption. Punk bled from near his right eye after some sort of errant strike earlier on in the match. That was minor, however, compared to a more substantial gash that Punk sustained at the top of his forehead. Apparently, when Mysterio gave Punk a Hurricane Rana into the ringside barricade, Punk's head made contact with a piece of metal, drawing blood. Hardway blood from a gaping wound is bad enough on its own, but worse, in the eyes of the attending fans in Detroit, was the brief match stoppage to tend to the wound. Since it was now the PG era and sponsors' comfort was of the highest priority, the match was briefly halted to try and stem the bleeding. Punk was visibly annoyed as Charles Robinson applied a towel to the cut, while Mysterio continued selling outside the ring to stall for time. Fans were just as unhappy months earlier when Christian had a cut tended to during a match at TLC, but WWE had their rules and they needed to be followed. Oh, except in the instance of Brock Lesnar at Hell in a Cell 2015, because in that case, you just approach the beast at your own risk. In fact, earlier in the night when McIntyre scraped his elbow during the IC title match, the decision was made to shoot tightly on his face, avoiding any camera shots of his arm to avoid upsetting anyone. Apparently, the wrath of Mattel is more frightening than the wrath of Khan or even more frightening than the callous indifference of Nick Khan, for example. Punk finished the match, lost to Mysterio, and proceeded to get his head shaved while still caked in blood. It was definitely a look, for certain. Two matches later, Edge battled Orton for custody of their overrated 2006 mashup theme that somehow made Edge's half of the song sound like really heavily watered down Stone Temple Pilots from the mid 90s, did anyone else get that? On that subject, by the way, was there ever an official title for that mashup? Given that Burn In My Lingus is the most viable option, perhaps it's best that there wasn't any title in the end. Anyhow, Edge and Orton were at or near the top of their game in 2010 and can usually be counted on to deliver the goods, provided they're not giving us a 35 minute guided tour of the Performance Center at the same time. Unfortunately, the Edge Orton match didn't exactly live up to expectations, though there was a pretty damn good reason for that. Late in the match, Orton took his familiar attacking stance, punching the canvas, the usual act of summoning that he does before going surface to air for his RKO. Unfortunately for Orton, his body was working against him that night. Whilst punching the mat, Orton actually injured his shoulder with sources differing as to whether it was a dislocation or a separation. As it turns out, Orton suffers from a condition called hypermobility in which his shoulder joints are extra flexible, which leaves him more susceptible to injury. In fact, Orton actually ended up on the shelf long-term in 2015 after injuring his shoulder while simply taking out the garbage at home. Knowing and understanding that, one can probably see how a simple act like punching the canvas could be so damaging. 
Left in obvious pain, Orton relayed the injury to Edge, and the two improvised a double count-out finish, where Edge took himself out, trying to spear Orton through the barricade. It was an underwhelming finish, definitely, but they had little other choice given the circumstances. Heading into the Cena vs Batista main event, Over the Limit was looking like a bit of a cursed card. In addition to some pretty uninspired title matches, you know, like Show vs Swagger for example and Eve Torres vs Maurice, three matches had been hindered by injury. One wrestler knocked silly, one match losing steam because of a blood delay, and one requiring an altered finish because of a significant shoulder injury. Punk vs Mysterio and the tag title match turned out to be quite good overall, but otherwise this was quite the wounded B show. It was up to Cena and Batista to try and end the night on a high note. So now's probably a good time to mention that they both suffered unique injuries during the main event. Cena found himself in the same boat as Punk when Batista power slammed him off the announce table through the Spanish announce table, somehow drawing blood from Cena above his eye. The laceration was very minor compared to, say, the time Cena almost bled to death at Judgment Day five years earlier, but of course this was 2010, and because Mattel is as frightening as Haku armed with a broadsword, the match was briefly halted to tend to the wound. The fans began turning on the stoppage, so the ever-wise Drax the Destroyer dragged Cena to his feet and threw him over the barricade to carry on the match. You may be wondering why after such an insignificant amount of blood loss, Cena's predicament ends up on this video. Well, that's because he also apparently lost a tooth during the main event. Yes, days after the pay-per-view, Cena tweeted that he spent three hours at the dentist after having one of his teeth fall out during the course of the brawl. Meanwhile, Batista's injuries occurred during the match's conclusion. After giving Batista an attitude adjustment onto the hood of a car that was part of the entrance set, Cena set up to perform his finish one more time, this time from the top of the car and off the stage. Fearing his imminent demise, Batista screamed that he quit, conceding the match to Cena. And being the good sportsman that he is, Cena celebrated his victory by launching Batista off anyway. Batista landed on a gimmicked part of the staging area, which he went through, ultimately landing on a crash pad. While the area was prepared for as safe a landing as possible, Batista ended up injuring his back and tailbone, taking the big AA. On a night filled with injuries, it's unfortunately fitting that the final significant spot resulted in one too. So after all of that, what were the immediate futures of all the injury victims? After sustaining his concussion, DBRC missed close to two weeks of action. He returned to the ring on a house show 12 nights later in South Carolina, losing to Mark Henry via DQ. Punk didn't miss any time as a result of his wound, and in fact found a pretty handy cover for it, a mask which was meant to hide his sudden hair loss at the hands of Mysterio. The now hooded Punk wrestled a 14-minute match at that week's SmackDown tapings, defeating Kane in a number one contender's qualifying match. As for Orton and his shoulder issue, more than two weeks passed before he took to the ring again, and three weeks passed before he had a match that went longer than two minutes. Given the difference between a dislocation and a separation, it seemed like the Viper ended up on the more favourable end of the spectrum. Cena continued his schedule unabated. Though his injury was merely a flesh wound, shout out to the Black Knight, Cena probably would have continued wrestling even if he'd lost a limb. He'd probably grow back, in fact, like some sort of jorts wearing starfish or something like that. As for Batista, it didn't really matter what his prognosis was as far as wrestling went. That's because the loss to Cena was Batista's last match for over three and a half years, as he parted way with WWE at the end of May. The 41-year-old animal wanted to give both MMA and acting a go, and while he did fight once in 2012, Big Dave has found his true calling on the silver screen. So as far as the ramifications of all these injuries, there really weren't any. Everyone that was planning on continuing in WWE was able to wrestle again before long, and it didn't seem to mess up the future booking much. Morbid as it might be to say, the fact that five wrestlers sustained some sort of notable injury was the most noteworthy thing about the 2010 Over the Limit. History has otherwise relegated it deep into the filing cabinet of just another show, maybe more bad than good on account of some of the pedestrian booking and unsatisfactory finishes. It is nonetheless a curious event to look back on, because how often do five wrestlers, including four current or former world champions, get notably hurt on the same pay-per-view? It may have been another day at the office as far as the booking went, but in terms of median health and wellness, Over the Limit 2010 was anything but.